right? Can you see that? Perfect. It's uh, we. Uh, can you try your pointer? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. You. You all good. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. And now I'm going to switch gears a little bit from the previous talks and actually move on to the topic of the double topic. And I'm going to tell you about the massive treaty double copy that has been recently explored. And I'm going to start by telling you a bit about how to do the double copy for scattering amplitudes and move on to gravitational wave sets at the end. And this is work based on this paper that we put out in July and a paper that's going to come out this week. So keep an eye on the archive. And this is work I did with these two grad students, Arsha Momeni and the students Umbutis, that are on the postdoc market right now. And they're amazing. So just keep an eye for their applications. So let me start by reviewing the standard BCJ double copy that we all know, but now how it works for the massive case. And this was explored in two very nice papers that came out around the same time by these people. And here I'm going to introduce them with a maybe slightly different notation than usual with a matrix notation. And basically the idea of doing a massive double copy is to simply consider um, gauge vectors that now are massive and massive barbitons. And to do that, we simply want to take the standard definition and take the Mendelstein variables to now include this massive part. So as usual, we can write our young Mills amplitude in terms of a color factor. This is the kinematic numerators and, and now our propagators that are massive propagators. And in our matrix, matrix notation, this is going to be given in terms of these vector Cs, the matrix D for the propagators and the kinematic numerators in this vector N. So as usual, to construct a double copy, we would expect that we just have to exchange color for kinematics and we will write, have this simple relationship. Um, but to, to be able to exchange color and kinematics, we know that we require the, the color kinematics duality, which means that the color factors and the kinematic factors satisfy the same algebra. So in this case, I'm going to write the algebra in the following form where this M basically is just a matrix that is form of plus, minus one, and zeros, and that gives you uh, your standard Jacobi relations. So for example, for the 4D case, this is, is a three times three matrix, and it just has a row of ones. So for example, if it has ones over here, the rest is zero and it's acting on your CS, CT, and CU to give you your standard Jacobi relations. But for the massive case, it actually turns out that this is not satisfied, which would immediately uh, make us think that there's a problem and you don't have color kinematics duality, so you cannot do a double copy. But in fact, uh, there's the generalized gauge transformations that are going to save us because now you can shift your kinematic numerators in this standard way, which in the case of the massless fields, will just leave this relationship invariant, so there's nothing you can do there. But in the massive case, it actually changes this relation while leaving our yang mills amplitude invariant. And that means that these delta n's, the shifts, actually satisfy the following relationship that if you just substitute back in here, since the color factors satisfy our Jacobian relationship, we give you zero. So now we can um, do the double copy because we can always shift our numerators to satisfy color kinematics duality. And we will say, OK, we can construct a double copy with these shifted numerators. But First of all, we need to see if we can construct the shifted numerator satisfying now n plus delta n is equal to zero. And this requirement actually gives us the following relationship, where this vector v is just the one that appeared in the previous slide over here. So this relationship um, actually contains a lot of zeros, as I showed you before, this matrix m that tells you what is your algebra actually has several zeros. So you are going to end up wanting to find what's B so you can find actually what's your shifted numerator. And to find this B, we're going to have to find the inverse of this matrix. So we're going to take the non zero components that now I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation. I'm calling this A and this one's U. So just for you to remember, this U is going to be the one that tells you by how much the original kinematic numerators don't satisfy the color kinematics algebra. 
So once you have this notation, you can just construct now here double copy, but instead of constructing it with your original ends, you use it with your shifted ends. I'm going to call it n tilde, so these ones. And once you do that, you will find that instead of having the standard relationship in terms of your original unshifted kinematic numerators, which will just be this part, you're going to get an extra part, which is given now by the following contraction of matrices. And there's an issue here because you have to invert, as I said, this matrix A, which is basically um, the denominator matrix sandwich in between the matrix for the color kinematic algebra. And spurious poles actually can arise when you do this inversion. And actually, this was shown that at four points, the, this matrix A is something very simple. It's just the sum of the propagators, so you don't get any spurious poles, which tells you that you can double copy anything you want at four points. But at five points, um, it was also shown that a problem arises. It's the fact that the determinant of this matrix, which will appear in the denominator here, will give you the spurious poles from this uh, very ugly polynomial that arises. So you have an issue. Now you find that the double copy is something that is non-local. You don't have the physical poles that you will expect from a massive gravity theory. Uh, and the question is, what is the solution to this? And this was found in this paper last year that uh, it can be avoided if you consider a tower of massive states now, where every um, in interaction now in your four point could be different, for example. And if they satisfy the so-called spectral condition between the masses of the states that's given here. And it is known that um, the theory that satisfies this spectral condition is Galois-Zeklin theory. And let me just uh, leave this advertisement here that we are currently exploring um, with another grad student, Xu Liang and Mark Troden, uh, if there are the possibility of having interactions between the John Kalus Eklin theory that satisfy the spectral condition and can still be double copy. But for now, let me move on to something different, which is how to avoid these spurious poles in a different way. And what we realize is that in three dimensions, there's a simplification for this determinant. So this determinant, is, instead of being just like an ugly polynomial, it actually has some structure, which means that it's proportional to a determinant, the dot product of the momenta, where this is smaller than five, which means that if you take it in the equal string, this is going to be zero, which is very nice because it's what we want. We want the rank of this matrix to be reduced, which means that you will get some relationships between the kinematic numerators or alternatively, between your color order amplitudes, which is similar to what happens in the MATLAS case, meaning you have some BCG relations that is what allows you to have color kinematics duality in the standard way and have a physical double copy. So in 3D, we find indeed that uh, this determinant is zero, which leads to the fact that this A has a null vector that I'm gonna be calling E zero, which implies this, uh, what I'm gonna be calling a BCJ relation. And this relation here, it's written basically in terms of, um, of the kinematic numerators, but it also can be written in the standard um, way with color order amplitudes, but it's more complicated than the standard BCJ relations that were used to import the massless case. And just so, as a reminder, this U is what measures the non-zero of, uh, of the algebra of the original kinematic numerators. But the question now is if having just a single BCJ relation would be enough to have a, a correct double copy, a physical double copy. Because in 4D, we know that we require actually four BCJ relations or five ones. And in fact, we have shown that uh, a simple one BCJ relation is enough in the equals three. It factorizes the amplitudes correctly. And even though it's not obvious that the spurious poles are gone, we check that the, recid the residues of the spurious poles are zero. So everything is local, physical, and you only have physical poles in your amplitude, which is great. So now the question is, which kind of um, theory satisfies this VCJ relation? And what we found is that these topologically massive theories are the ones that satisfy such relations. So now I'm going to give you a very short introduction to topologically massive theories. And 
let me start by introducing topological massive gravity, which consists of your Einstein Hilbert term plus a gravitational Chern Simons term. And given this Chern Simons term, we have parity broken, and this theory actually only describes one degree of freedom, so only one helicity. So your massive graviton in 3D, you will expect to have two degrees of freedom, but here this only describes one of the helicities, so we have one degree of freedom. Now, the topologically massive Jack Mills, in a similar way, just has your standing Jack Mills term, but also a Chern Simons term, which again breaks parity. And in a similar way, uh, just propagates one degree of freedom, one helicity instead of the two helicities that you could expect from a massive gauge field in 3D. So the degrees of freedom counting works for what you would expect for the double copy, which is great. And as I mentioned before, now the question is if the scattering amplitudes for the topologically massive Young Mills will satisfy the PCJ relation that we require so that the double copy is physical. And indeed, what we show um, is that they do satisfy this. And we checked explicitly that the three point, four point, and five point uh, amplitudes double copy do topologically massive gravity. So at three points, the amplitude is something very simple, which I'm giving you here. And indeed, double copies to what you have in topologically massive gravity. At four points, as I said in the beginning, you can double copy basically any theory you want. So in principle, building a double copy is not surprising, but maybe slightly more surprising is that indeed it corresponds to the topologically massive gravity amplitude. But the most important part is that at five points, we checked that indeed when you construct a double copy, you find that the, the amplitude corresponds to the topologically massive gravity amplitude. And this follows since uh, we indeed have this VCJ relation for topologically massive young mills. Now, um, the expressions for these are very long and ugly, so I'm not going to show them here. In fact, we don't even show them in the paper because we check this numerically because it's very complicated. So it would be interesting to know if there's another formalism uh, that allows us to write this in a more com compact way that you can see explicitly the double copy relation. But for now, let me move on to a new question. And that is what happens if we include matter in these theories? So now let's consider amplitudes where you have also a minimal coupling of matter between your um, either massive young mills field, topologically massive young mills field, or your topologically massive graviton. And in certain contexts, this has been explored by these authors in different papers. And the results basically tell you that there is a non trivial double copy relationship. So you don't simply get the political massive gravity here, you get something extra. But um, it all seems to point to the fact that if you have matter where the stress energy tensor is actually, the trace of the stress energy tensor is zero, then the standard double copy relationship holds. And actually this agrees with what, um, what we check from the scattering amplitude side. So we look at the scattering of two to two scalars that interact through a topologically massive mediator. And when we double copy this, we find that you don't only get uh, the scalars interacting to a topologically massive graviton, but you also require an extra contact term between these scalars, which again tells you that uh, there's something else you need on the gravitational side. Now, I, I, I think to notice is that this contact term is gonna be splitting in the iconal limit, which corresponds again with sources that will have a stress energy tensor with stress vanishes. So what I'm gonna focus now is exactly on the high energy limit of these scattering amplitudes. So let me do a very quick review of the iconal limit in which we consider high energy, meaning that S is our largest scale larger than our mass and the um, transfer momentum T is very small. I'm interested in this limit because we expect a simple double copy relationship for the topologically massive theories. And also because in 4D, it has been shown that there is a very simple relationship between the iconal amplitudes in this limit. And this simple relationship relies on the fact that the amplitudes exponentiate in the iconal limit. So the iconal amplitude can be written in the following way, where delta is our phase shift that only depends on the three level scattering amplitude in the iconal limit. Now, um, 
This exponentiation has been proven for uh, Yang Mills and gravity in the massless case, and also in, for massive spin theories in P equals four and larger. But to the best of our knowledge, it hasn't been proved yet for the topologically massive theories that we're talking about. So one thing we did was to actually prove explicitly that this exponentiation also works in this case, and it does, which would be maybe the first step to give you hope that things will double copy nicely and simply. But once you start looking at how to double copy the three level amplitudes in the iconal limit, you'll see that uh, things are not as straightforward. So what I'm showing you here is the amplitude for topologically massive electrodynamics. And we look at the abelian case for simplicity because we expect both abelian and non-abelian cases to actually double copy to the same gravitational theory. So this amplitude has this charge, our color factor, our kinematic factor now is in the Manstar variable S times this term. And if we just exchange Q now for our S, which will be similar to how the double copy works in the icon of limit for a standard massless 4D case, we'll see that uh, we do not obtain uh, the topologically massive gravity amplitude in the icon of limit. So we could naively think that this is um, just something again that you need something on the side of the gravitational theory extra here, but that's not the case. Indeed, this is just an artifact of how the massive double copy works. So if, if we take the relationship that I showed you in the beginning, if you remember, you don't simply have the sum of n squares over the propagators, which in the iconal limit, the leading term is just the t-channel. You also have an extra part, um, which was the inverse of that matrix A that I showed you, which at four point gives you this term. Now, uh, this is not subdominant in the iconal, indeed it's of the same order, and we require this extra term to actually obtain the correct double copy in the iconal limit, which means that you need information outside of the iconal limits from the S and U channels to actually obtain the correct double copy. And again, this is just an artifact of how the massive double copy works, which is more complicated than the massless case. Nevertheless, if you actually take this in the tree level, you, you will indeed find a double copy relationship. But um, we wanted to go beyond just exploring the amplitudes, and we wanted to see if we can actually see an explicit double copy for classical solutions. And to do that, we, we use our amplitudes and simply relate it to what would be the background that um, they're related to. So now I can consider a point particle that's propagating in the background, given, for example, by this metric. And I'm assuming this background is generated by the other scalar field that it is scattering with. So it's basically going to be a shockwave background. And if I do this computation just in a standard quantum mechanics non-relativistic way, I will find that the amplitude is the following. So now I can just match this to the result that I found for my field theory. And taking into account the non-relativistic normalizations, we will find that uh, what is the metric that for the shockwave background. But uh, one thing to notice here is that this is not straightforward because there is a choice of the I epsilon prescription to regulate the phase shift. So let me go back here. So this phase shift now is going to be the integral of this amplitude. And there's going to be a pole at t equals 0 that we need to regulate. And we can choose different I epsilon prescriptions. And depending on that I epsilon prescription, this is going to determine what are the boundary conditions on our metric. So the question now is if there are certain boundary conditions that allow us to see a manifest double copy in coordinate space. And we found that there are a very specific set of boundary conditions that we require, and these are the ones used in the, this paper that are useful for doing a time delay computation. So now let me show you our results. And basically, uh, using these boundary, special boundary conditions that I mentioned, the shockwave solutions can be written in the TMG case in terms of a Kirchhoff metric where the Kirchhoff scalar is the following, which means on one side of the shock wave, this would be this white, bigger than zero side, we have this simple form and we have a different form on the other side. Same for the Yang Mills field and for the bi bio joint scalar. So what you can notice here is that uh, 
the double copy only seems to work in this usual way on one side of the shockwave. So this would be the uh, positive Y side. On the other side, we clearly see that the Kirchhoff double copy does not work, but this shouldn't worry you because if you actually compute the curvature and the field strength for these solutions on that side of the double copy, the curvature is zero, the field strength is zero. So there's nothing to really double copy. And the reason for this is because um, for these shockwave solutions, it doesn't allow you to write uh, your metric with the same coordinate chart on both sides of your shockwave. So this is a standard thing that's known and this simply implies that we can only write a explicit coordinate double copy on one side of the shockwave, which we chose to be the positive Y side. But it also hints um, towards something more. And that is that uh, maybe a more natural double copy arises if you look at the curvatures and the field strengths. So that's what we did and we found that if you look at the UU component of the cotton tensor, and this is the only non-zero component, it is actually given by the square of the field strength of, of your yang mill solution. So one could ask if why is this very nice double copy relationship arising? And maybe a hint for this can be looking at linearized solutions for plane waves. So if we look at our cotton tensor, which is basically given by the derivative of the rich tensor. So this is of order P cube. Um, if we want to put an answer of how this would be given in terms of a square of our field strength, instead of just having two field strengths of order P, you'll realize you'll need an extra derivative to match the derivative order. So in principle, you will expect something like this that doesn't look much like a double copy relation. But once you use the linearized equation of motion of topologically massive Yang Mills, you see that this is actually given by the mass times the dual of the field strength, which brings us to this um, cotton double copy relation. So now let me analyze side to side this cotton double copy versus the standard and well known vial double copy in 4D. Because this is very similar to what happens in 4D, but now in the 3D massive case. So we know that the vial double copy in 4D can be written for the vial spinner as the square of the end of the field strength spinner. And this is thanks to the fact that in 4D, we have that the Lorentz group is isomorphic to SL2C. Now, for the equations of motion in the massless case in 4D, we have that the Bianchi identity gives us that this covariant derivative of the vial spinner is zero. And Maxwell's equations are simply written in this simple way. And you also have our scalar field equation that's just that the scalar being harmonic. Now, on the side of now our proposal for the cotton double copy, we are going to take advantage of the fact that the Lorentz group in 3D is now isomorphic to SL2R, which kind of simplifies things a lot because you're just working with reals now. And the proposal is now that the cotton spinner is proportional to the field strength squared spinner with now a proportionality constant given by the mass. And again, the equations of motion are very similar because the Bianchi identity will again imply now in 3D that the covariant derivative of the cotton spinner is zero, but now for a topologically massive electrodynamics field, we have now a massive term. And this will in turn imply that the uh, scalar field would now satisfy the equation of motion for a massive um, field. Mariana, five minutes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so let me just uh, almost conclude with an example of how this cotton double copy works for waves. And Apologies for those not familiar with the standard human pervers formalism and spinners, so I'm going to have to go a bit quick on this. Uh, but basically, this cotton tensor, well, this cotton spinner can be written in terms of a basis of spinners, here I'm calling O, and this Newman Penrose scalar psi 4. And this would be the case if you are considering type N solutions, which are wave solutions. Um, and 
the classification of space times actually in terms of the cotton tensor works exactly in the same way as the classification of space times in 4D for the vial. So this is very analog to what you will, what you know for the vial level copy. And on the other hand, for the field strength, we also can write in terms of its Newman Penrose scalar that for a wave solution will just be the uh, phi two. So this gives us this very simple relationship between the Newman Penrose scalars for wave solutions, uh, where the psi four is equal to the phi two square. And we have checked this relationship for several cases. So the shock wave solution that I just showed you indeed satisfies this uh, very nice relationship. And we can also include a classical spin on the source of the shock wave and get our gyroton solutions, where we will see indeed that this relationship is also satisfied. And it has a very simple um, relation by shifting the energies of the shock waves to energy plus the spin times the mass. And finally, we checked also the ADS shock waves. So if this double copy works also on curved space times, which it does with the only modification that um, the scalar field now has a non-minimal coupling given by R over six, which is something that we've been seeing is very standard when we try to consider the double copy on curved space times. So let me just conclude by telling you that indeed we have a lot of arguments to say now that topological massive gravity is the square of topologically massive genials. Here I've shown you that the BCJ double copy works all the way up to five points. And I also show you that there is a Kirchhoff double copy for flat space waves that is highly dependent on your choice of boundary conditions. And lastly, I show you that there's also a cotton double copy for waves, which gives you this very nice relation. But there are a lot of things that we could still explore, basically, if this also holds for type B or including different types of matter, since as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this might screw up our double copy relationship. So let me just finish telling you one more time that this was a work done with these grad students currently on the post of market. And thank us again for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Marianne, for a very nice talk and perfect timing. And uh, let me remind everyone that there is a Slack channel. If you come up with a question to you, Tim, and Indo Mariana, feel free to post it there. And now we have some time for a few minutes for questions. So please, um, someone from the audience or from the chat. Uh, yes, there is a question by Donald, please. Hi, um, let's see. Turn on my video so you can see me. Um, yeah, thanks for. Donald, you have muted yourself. No, I'm still muted. Oh, God. Okay, okay now well, I hope you can now hear me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. okay. Yeah, that was a great talk. So thanks very much. Um, I was just wondering about um, these double copies um, in three dimensions. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about lately are, are trying to understand double copies from the point of view of three-point amplitudes. Um, yes. What sort? You know, are there three-point amplitudes that are that you can get hold of for these top, topologically massive theories in three D? Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, are you thinking of three-point amplitudes of purely gluons or including matter? Well, because both. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm trying to trying to think of these solutions that you've been discussing are related to some kind of three point amplitude that could be sourcing them. Oh, yes, yes. Um, that might be a little bit related also to the work that uh, Nathan Moynihan has been doing. Um, also on topologically massive gravity double copies. Um, I don't think we have any explicit relationships just like in the 4D case, but yeah, the three-point amplitudes are easy to write, and there's probably and, a, a and they go on shell, are they? Because I mean, it's hard to get three-point amplitudes on shell and without doing something funny to your kinematics. Maybe you have to go to a complex momentum or something. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess we haven't checked, but probably you have. To, you, well, you have if you want them on shell, you have to go to complex momentum, but. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean that's not necessarily. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm wondering. <laughs> I, I know in four D you have this nice relationship. You can go to two to two, two comma two signature, but <laughs> I mean you couldn't do that here, so I don't know. 
yeah, yeah. that's right that's what i'm thinking about <laughs> <No>, space <laughs> yeah yeah well. Uh, but maybe, I mean, you can also think about these things. I mean, we use two true signature because it seemed like a good idea, but um, but you can also do it with complex, um, like an analogy continuation. Anyway, yeah, I mean, maybe that's the way to go. It'd be interesting to look at it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I think uh, in, 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 in view of time, I suggest we Finish the session here. It's we just posted uh, the link to the Slack channel. So let's thank all the speakers again. And uh, uh, 